Parker, what happened to your? Oh, so current events. Leah and Parker. Well, Leah's not here. Parker. I don't think Leah's going to be here the rest of the So, does someone want to jump up a while? Bad? All right. Well, I just have to back up. That's the next in line. Right? Don't let me forget about this. You don't have to get all much. I don't think you should be here the rest of the week. I'm going to be going this Friday then. Yeah, is that okay? Oh, it's a short week for you. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for tea, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you get to hear? Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thanks, man. Good stuff up. Hey. Let's see what we to do. Exactly. Why are you asking? Sorry. <laughs> He's waiting for a fresh start line. As you're working on the bell ringer, we will have a test here, I'm thinking Monday of next week, but we'll see, we'll see. I usually don't like to have a test on a Monday, but we will have a review, I promise, it'll come to it. <laughs> then they do it anyway. Oh, the doomsday test, right? Oh, sounds terrible. It sounds terrible. It's not too bad, I promise. It is worth 125 points. Pretty wild. Look at that. I didn't check to see if you were know, ever raised the tax. You did. He said, let you know if something else, if something else didn't get there soon. And I didn't even look to see if mine was good. So. You know what? First period here, this was good. The castle projects were great there. Got the day started. And then. We, I literally got the day started. I was first. You were first. Yeah, that's right. Dude, I had the classic clan space set up. Yeah, exactly. I had Expo set the ground and it. I was waiting for someone to actually just put a screenshot of it. <laughs> I, I was saying. Hang on. Let's give us some credit. I mean, if you want to detail, I'll describe it. Oh my god, dude. Why didn't I think of that? I don't know why. Why not? I mean, that's what the game's pretty much all about. It really is. All right, here we go. So, we left off talking about William the Conqueror. Where is he from? Where is he from? Chris? France. Okay, France. Where specifically? <coughs> but, like, the, the Norman nation. Yeah, good job. So, Normandy, right up here in northern France. Good job. Good job. So, William the Conqueror, he was of what descent? What was he? Paul. Oh. Yeah, good job, good job. So he was a descendant of Vikings. And we talked about the Frank Kingdom, how that was somewhat divided after Charlemagne's death and allowing for the Viking raid.
rates become more prevalent here in what we know of the Frank Higgins and modern day France. Good, so they settled here in northern France, Normandy, and William the Conqueror decided to conquer England. Why did he decide to do it? What was the reason for that? Pretty, pretty wild to think about. Connor, go ahead. You didn't like today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's like, oh, I don't like that guy. I, I don't like Harold the second. He just doesn't seem like a good king. He doesn't seem like he's good. Right? If anything, they should have just went across the English Channel and uh, chose the answer. So Why he sent his troops. What's that? He said, the mind could change. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So he decides to send his troops, fortify his troops, and create a fleet to go across the English Channel to destroy and conquer it. Right? And what was that battle where he was victorious? That called Austin's awesome. the Battle of Leeds. Yeah, good job. Good job. You know what year it was? Uh oh. It's years. It's Battle of Hastings. What was the one? Hey, Matt, go ahead. Was it um, 1066? You got it. 1066. So, quite a bit ago. I was close. Sorry. Man. So, 1066. All right. Normandy. Okay. The Normans, Mongolian the Conqueror, they take over England. What does he first do? What does he do? Does he establish all throughout England? Why? He appoints himself as king. Oh, yeah, he does that. Oh, and then he moves. How do I get it with the workers to do it now to check the population? Okay. Whatever that's about. Yeah, so we'll get to the Doomsday Book. Here. Oh, but fine. what does he do initially? Right when he conquers England. Conquers. Yeah, good job. So he goes on this conquest of building all these castles all across England. And the reason for his protection, right? And if you protect the people, chances are they'll abide by your rule. And that's exactly what occurred. So then the Doomsday Book, okay, why? What was it? All right, so I said <clears throat> it was the first time because it had the land of England laid out and the population that grew over. Yeah, good job. So this was yeah. never really seen before. And yeah, during feudalism, during these feudal times, uh, the lords would kind of take account of farmland account of the resources and materials they have, but well, right? but at the same time, this has never been seen, especially when a newly formed force coming over, Normans conquering England. Okay, you want to know about the population, you want to know about the wealth, you want to know about uh, more of England itself. So that's what the Doomsday Book really all is about. It was a survey, it was a consensus really to see exactly the population, the wealth, the land owned by these people. All right, good, good, good. So. Uh, why do you think that's so important? Why do you think it's important to have it? Paul? Yeah, yeah, good job. It'd be well informed, right? So, you guys take freedom to debate government. You guys ever hear of citizenship test? Yeah, all right. So, there's 100 questions to it. They're all pretty simple, <coughs> pretty basic. But you'd be surprised some people will trip up on some of the questions. But, yeah, it's important to be well informed about the country. Especially for William the Conqueror, they would take it over. Right? He wants to know the ins and the outs. He wants to know the wealth. He wants to know the population. He wants to know the land owned by the people in England. All right, good, good, good. Okay, so again, this is something of just knowledge, understanding of the land. So, so why else is it important to talk about William the Conqueror? What else does it bring to us? We speak it today. Go ahead, Paul. The English language, good job. The English culture is being formed with. The traditions, the culture, the language of the Normans, applying it to the Anglo Saxons that were already residing here in England. All right, good. Is there any questions on that? I know we talked a little bit about it yesterday, but I want to make sure we review it before we move on and talk about some of the rights given to people, especially early on here in the Middle Ages. Carolyn, what's up? See, now if America had the system of, oh, you don't like the Portuguese so overthrow them, America would be going into anarchy stages almost every four years. Oh my gosh. Every yeah. I mean, now more than ever, it just seems like it's polarized, right? Uh, it seems like it's just no agreements wow. whatsoever. I lost but, that yeah, yeah, they actually did a, they actually did a survey this past week. The results came back and they're like, oh, so if you could choose, uh, either a democracy with you know, the person that you don't want to be president from an opposite party, or a dictator of your current political party, what would you choose? And the numbers were shocking, to say the least. It wasn't a majority, but there was about 40% on each side that said, you know what, we'd be fine with an absolute you know, monarch, like a leader, a dictator of that party.
party that they're of their choosing. I think that's crazy to think about, but those were the results. Of it. Okay, so here we go. Here are your terms for today. We've got Henry the First, Henry the Second, Common Law, the Magna Carta, Romanesque architecture, and Gothic architecture. There you go. There you go. So I'll give you some time to work on that. We'll review it, review it, we'll discuss it, and then we will move on with the notes. So reminder, these terms will be due at the end of the chapter, which is coming up quick. So make sure you have all the terms. If you maybe you missed some, look back to the video lessons. While you're there, you might as well like and subscribe. But uh, make sure you have those terms. Classic. What's up, Matt? Really?
Okay. All right, so Henry the First. Let me know about Henry the First. Why is he important? Two to three more minutes. Oh my gosh. Okay, you guys need another minute? Yeah. Okay, all right, I'll give you another minute. Sorry, guys. All right, so what do we know about Henry the First? What do we know about Henry the First? Go ahead, Wyatt. He was the first son of like four, not first. Okay, good. Fourth son of the family. So so William Cockney and Divine. Okay, all right, good, good. So Henry the First, he is the fourth son of William the Conqueror, but he will become the monarch, the king. Okay, of England here. And one thing to note about him is that he set up a court system, right? He set up royal finances. Why is it important to have a, a, royal, a court system? Why is it important to have that? Paul, go ahead. Okay, yeah, good job. Good job. So, reminder, I mean, you're looking at these kings here. They can do really whatever they want. Okay, uh, Chris, I think you were having... But why do push ups or turn 45 degrees? I don't know. Some cruel punishments to, to uh, Wyatt when we're going through a simulation. But uh, as this progresses, we're going to talk about how these rights are actually included and brought to the people of England under these rulers, under these monarchs. And Henry the First is one of the first that brought this court system to England. Yeah, that people have due process, that have a trial by jury. And this was unheard of at the times. Okay, this was very new. This was innovative. And it just showed that, you know, 
know what? Maybe the king was realizing to make sure that the people abide by this rule, you gotta give them some rights. Okay, you gotta give them some rights. You just can't rule over these people, you know, obviously uncontrollable. What about Henry II? What do we know about Henry II? What do we know about him? Chris, what do you have for Henry II? He took over Scotland and Ireland. Yeah, good job. Good job. So he was somewhat of a conqueror himself, right? And at the same time, one thing I want you to know is that he created common law. So what do you think common law is? What is it? Next term here. What's common law? A lot of, go ahead. Yeah, good job. Good job. So this is a visual set of laws. Okay, this is written down. This is document that people need to follow. Right? And this was, again, somewhat the first of its kind here in the Middle Ages. This was something seen in ancient times in Rome. But in the Middle Ages, medieval times, under the feudal system, that kind of disappeared. But now here we see it reemerge. We see it reappear. And in some cases, this might be a rebirth, a renaissance of ideas that were brought up during ancient times of Rome and Greece, and being brought forth again to help apply to the society, to help benefit them moving forward. Okay, so overall, these laws are creating order, right? creating stability. Okay, with that stability, we'll see a better lifestyle, a higher standard of living for these people. Okay, and this will lead eventually to what we know of the economy and the emergency origins of what we know of capitalism. So we will talk about that here soon. The Magna Carta. We have the Magna Carta. Paul is all over it today. Someone other than needs to be here. Amelia, go ahead. Awesome. Good job. Good job. So if you want to put in quotations right beside it, the Great Charter, please do that. You probably will see that on the test. So the Great Charter. This was signed in 1215. And uh, does anybody know a little bit more about it? Parker, go ahead. Um, basically said that Awesome. Yeah, good job. Good work, Mila and Parker, on that. So that is the Great Charter is really describing how the king is not above the law himself, and that uh, this was a document that is going to be pushed and sought and looked at by uh, the origins here, the fourth the founding fathers of the United States, to give rights to the people to make sure that the executive the king isn't above the law. Okay, providing rights for the people. And again, this is something unheard of. Whenever you think of Great Britain, you think of what? George III, you think of uh, a lot of the taxes on the people in the colonies, you think about how absolute their power really was. But actually, its principles, its origins were pretty good. And we look at uh, Great Britain and their form of laws and these creations like the Magna Carta as influences to our own constitution, to our own form of government. So the Magna Carta was ahead of its time. It gave people rights. It actually stripped powers away from the king. And does anybody know how this got brought up? You think the king would just squash any type of rebellion that's happening with the people. But what happened? Can you read into that? I'll show you a video tomorrow, but Caroline, go ahead. Good. Yeah, good job. So here the lords are. It's like, you know what? You know, you have too much power. Yeah, this isn't fair to us. There's a lot of disputes, a lot of issues that we're seeing within our kingdom. And uh, you need to face the fact here and give these people a little bit of breathing room. You need to give them some rights. And the Lords actually forced the king to sign the Great Charter, Charter of the Magna Carta, in 1215. And this was King John that had to sign. But this would be revised over and over and over again by kings moving forward if they maybe step out of line, if they maybe look to seek more power. And this is going to set up in the 1300s what? What do you think? The legislative body where elected officials come into play. Go ahead, Paul. Parliament. Yeah, good job. Good job. So that's pretty much what we know as Congress. Okay. These elected officials will be chosen by the people and they'll lead the country. All right. <laughs> and you can relate it to today, right? With Queen Elizabeth II, unfortunately, passing and uh, really. She was just a figurehead. It's not like she really had too many powers. She would address the nation during tough times, but overall, we see this shift, shift this change happen right around this time where elected officials are making all the decisions in the country, and not just the king. All 
All right, Romanesque architecture. We have. Right, Connor. A fusion of Roman, Carolinian, uh, Byzantine, and local American tradition. All right, yeah, good job, good job. So we're looking at Romanesque architecture. This is your block look, okay? These windows are high up on the uh, architecture of these buildings. Okay, the windows are pretty small, but you don't really see too many peak arches, okay? You see more round or, uh, arches here, okay? And you see a little bit more thicker walls. And uh, during the Roman times, you can clearly see what was Romanesque, what was Gothic. Okay, you see high pillars, high columns. Okay, and uh, there's actually architecture around every town today. When you look at it, you can say, you know what, that looks more Romanesque than anything. I'll show you examples here on the notes. Gothic architecture. Go ahead, Caroline. <laughs> Yeah, good job. So with the Gothic architecture, this is heavily designed. Okay, this is a lot influenced by the church. You see high arches, okay, peaked arches, and uh, uh, some of the cathedrals I showed you not too long ago. That is a combination of Romanesque and Gothic architecture together. You still see the columns, but you see the peaked arches. And uh, with this Gothic architecture, you could probably go around and look at the churches here, even in town. They realize, you know what, that resembles a lot of Gothic architecture. Same glass windows. I'm sure, you know what those look like as well. Again, I'll show you examples here of this architecture today. All right, so real quick, i got to roll through this. <clears throat> so when it came to the growth of centralized feudalism and the evolution of England's political system, okay, you have to start somewhere. And William the Conqueror with the Doomsday Book, that's where you can maybe say this begins. This was a survey, like I mentioned, of the people, the population, the land within England. It's important that he knows what's exactly the ins and outs of this land he just took over. And to make sure he could secure it, make sure that there is protection for the people. And like I mentioned, this was unheard of at the time. Right? For William the Conqueror, he thought, well, to make sure that they have abiding citizens, he need to give them rights, he need to give them protection. And then things will fall through. You won't see internal attacks. You won't see uh, issues arising internally if you give people rights. And there's a lot of truth to that, right? Why? Yeah. Yeah, you just can't be an overarching leader. Except in here, we talk. No Rubik's Cube. All right, so Henry the First, he's a son of William the Conqueror. And one close of the you know, really what he's known for is setting up the court system. Okay, making sure that there is a trial by jury. Making sure that people have the decision on another person, civil disputes, or maybe civil harm that they might cause. The king shouldn't just be the exact ruler, right? He shouldn't be looking over some of these civil disputes and solving himself. This actually has to be set up with a jury. This has to be set up with a judge that knows these laws and understand these laws and can interpret them. Right? So again, this is taking some of the powers away from the king. He also set up the Department of Royal Finances. So as England's becoming stronger, the goal is to make sure that this money's flowing in and that they can help fortify England. And this will eventually lead to what we know as the Age of Exploration. This will lead to the building of these stronger militaries and expanding England's dominance with colonization. So overall, we see stability here with William the Conqueror moving into his sons, Henry the First, and then eventually Henry the Second, the grandson of William the Conqueror. So the royal finances is important because we will talk about your commercial revolution. We will talk about the emergence of capitalism and how that's innovating societies uh, for the future. And we all know we have a capitalist system here, more of a mixed market economy now. But uh, overall, that drives innovation. That helps with prices and standard living. Henry II established principle of common law through the kingdom. There has to be a written set of laws, rights for the people that they need to know. And overall, this is a benefit to society as people know how to uh, obviously operate in society. There needs to be norms. There needs to be some sort of establishment of values to help bring society together. There can't be anarchy, right? There can't be any type of progress with anarchy or chaos. So this set of laws is a way to try to provide a structure, guidelines to the society, moving them in the right direction. 
All right, and obviously advancing the court system that Henry the First applied, utilizing his grand jury, trial by jury, and uh, making sure that the Lord, the King, doesn't have to decide on all these matters. All right, let's face it, the main gate has a hard, difficult job, so is it. And if he has to sit in with every civil dispute, that might take a long time. So trial by jury, might as well just let the people decide on a matter of someone. So again, this is the early stages. There's still somewhat of a lot of corruption with it. But in any case, this is the groundwork. Okay, this is the benefits of what we see today with our judiciary system, with our government, some of the influences. All right, so the Magna Carta. <clears throat> like I mentioned with the book have, the Magna Carta was the Great Charter, signed in 1215. King John, this was obviously some time afterwards of William the Conqueror, he was a little bit of abusive over his power, and it pushed the lords to actually try to bring his powers down and try to apply some sort of rights, some sort of freedoms for the people and take rights away from the king. So now the king just can't freely do whatever he wants or whatever he chooses. He can't just continue to tax the people Arrive, try to raise up a military, or to try to raise up his defenses. Right? That's really where it came about. He just kept issuing taxes over and over and over again. But we all know taxes is a fun thing, especially when they're rising. Does it help with community efforts? Of course, when it comes to public services, when it comes to military defense, when it comes to maybe health care, uh, education. But at the time, that really wasn't offered. But we will talk about education here. I actually have a sign here for you towards the end of class where we'll talk about it. You guys will read over some primary sources again. And uh, we'll mention it more tomorrow as we go through it together. Why? I forgot to mention you should probably watch the package get absolutely Dude. looked. Dude. Dude. Oh, Magna Carta right now. Quiet. All right. Uh, so, yeah. It's okay. When it came down to it, the lords, the nobles, the higher nobility, they are a little sick of. King's power and abuse of power. And the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, was a set of rights, again, that the people had, taking away rights from the king, taking away his absolute power. And this, like I mentioned with the book that will lead to the development of Parliament, where we'll actually have elected officials uh, seeking the, in the, uh, in the opinions, the interests of the people. So people have voting representation. Again, this is a rebirth of ideas. We saw this in the Roman Empire. Okay, as people were elected officials in to represent a republic, okay, and this was conversion. And see, then through this rebirth with the Middle Ages in England. All right, so is everybody good with the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, 1215? And again, guys, this is an influence to the U.S. Constitution. This is an influence to the government of the United States. All right, moving on here. So when it comes to trade, we will talk about commercial revolution here. We will talk about how capitalism gets its roots and starts. And uh, England is where it begins. We'll talk about Adam Smith. We'll talk about the wealth of nations. Okay, but that won't happen until later in the 1700s. But this idea of trading, this idea of utilizing currency for services is emerging here in the Middle Ages, okay, during the high Middle Ages. So you remember with feudalism, the uh, king would give what to the Lord in return of loyalty? What would he give him? For the most part, time, it was a thief, right? You guys remember talking about a thief? But what was in the thief? Go ahead, Austin. Land, exactly, right? Land. So, yeah, land is an asset. Land is something that obviously is going to build wealth. But now we start to see a change, a shift. No longer do you see people just saying, hey, I'll give you this land if you, you know, do the service for me for the rest of your life. How about you just pay me currency? How about you pay me in some sort of uh, way that I can use this currency to establish myself even more, to innovate more, to expand the marketplace? So this is the emergence of these trade routes of what we know as modern-day capitalism. This is the origins of it here in the Middle Ages. All right, so here's a picture below. Medieval towns, okay? We talked about the manor. We talked about the castle, right? So in the background, you can see the castle way in the background. It's separate from the village. But now these villages become a little bit different, right? These towns are starting to merge, especially with the commercial revolution, with capitalism emerging. And we see more trading. We see more innovation. A lot of the buildings become a little bit more sophisticated. The lives of the peasants become better. 
right? And the reason for it is because of trade, because of the commercial revolution. Right? This is advancing life all throughout England, and eventually this will lead into Europe as well. But overall, we see a higher standard of living for the peasants. No longer are they just working on the farm field constantly. They might pick up different crafts, like being a blacksmith, like being a craftsman of some sort, and overall benefiting the economy of the time. So this is the emergence of what we know as modern day economy, capitalist economy, commercial revolution. All right, you guys good with that? Okay, moving on here. Expansion of trade, real quick with guilds. All right, so a guild really just means a craft, right? It really just means how uh, these people are coming together and asserting themselves in the economy. All right? This is a group of people that is establishing a, a sense of stability of the economy within these medieval towns and the early medieval towns. So guilds develop their group who work the same occupation. They control wages and prices and they're skilled artisans. Well, this is your blacksmiths, right? These are your people that are helping with goods and services for the people in the town. Like I mentioned, this is the emergence of what we know as modern day capitalism. Here they are focused on their certain craft making money, providing this supplies to the people, benefiting the people through this craft. All right, guys, because of time, I know you're writing notes down here. I'm going to move on here so you guys can check out the PowerPoint online. Okay, you guys can look at this slide, move on. But in all reality, the guild is just, like I said, this group of artisans coming together, forming a business, what we know as a modern-day industry. And the middle class emerges. So Romanesque architecture, real quick, I want to just talk about this. Romanesque architecture is rounded arches, thick walls, dark, simple interiors, small windows, usually high up. All right, so this is what we saw ancient Rome architecture. And like I mentioned, you go around town, you'll go around to these maybe cities, and you can see Romanesque architecture. Okay, so they're not peaked arches, they're rounded. Okay? These windows are high up more on these buildings. Okay, the windows are smaller, and these walls are pretty thick. They look heavily fortified in ways. Okay, that's really all about Roman architecture. And if you get a chance, go around town, maybe take pictures of these uh, buildings and say, you know what, this is Romanesque. You know what, this resembles a little bit of Gothic architecture. I think that'd be a cool homework assignment for you. All right, and then finally, we have Gothic architecture. We have archways, flying buttresses. What? Oh, man. So these are arches that are help supporting the building, supporting the architecture itself. Stained glass windows. As you can see, this architecture looks a lot more sophisticated. It looks more innovative. It looks cool, doesn't it? And uh, that's the name, hence Gothic architecture. With the high arching peaks, right? It comes to a peak. We have stained glass windows, uh, elaborate designs all across, inside, outside of these buildings. And it just looks totally different from the Romanesque look. So the inside of these buildings, the walls are a little less thicker. Okay, so providing a lot more elegant look internally of these buildings. All right, here's another look here. Gothic architecture, Romanesque at the bottom. You can definitely tell the difference between these architects. All right, hey, uh, don't worry about it. There's no homework tonight. I will go over the assignment tomorrow with you in class. How does that work? Does that work? Yeah? Oh, me being nice. All right, about the Packers. Oh, Notre Dame. We'll talk about it tomorrow. I just watched a hunchback in Notre Dame the other day.